Well, good afternoon. Let me welcome everyone that's viewing this, uh, the first edition of the DSI Security Services Security Evolution Podcast. Uh, we're operating under a little different conditions than we had predicted just a few months ago. So uh, we're changing things up a bit and wanted to go ahead and launch this first episode with uh, two of the most influential leaders that I know in the security industry to talk about what we're going through as it relates to the coronavirus uh, situation. It certainly impacted our world and our country, but also impacted security services in a very specific way. So uh, privilege for me to have a couple of great friends on the first episode here. Uh, Mark Palmer, who is the Vice President of Security Industry at TrackTick, and also Donna Vive, who is the President of Interforce. So I want to introduce these guys. We're going to have a great discussion about coronavirus here in a minute, but Wanted to start off by just having these guys tell a little bit about themselves and what they do. So Mark, why don't you start off for us? I knew I was gonna get to go first. Thank you, Eddie. Uh, really, uh, really happy to be there, uh, be there, be here, and uh, happy to be joined, uh, joined by both of you in, uh, in the basement instead of in the office. And um, essentially 20, nearly 25 year security uh, industry uh, veteran, for lack of a better word. Uh, from the uh, security service side, also uh, spent some time uh, on the corporate security team with a, a large telecommunication company, and then the last uh, over four years with uh, TrackTick, a security workforce management software uh, based out of Montreal, but uh, serving clients uh, essentially around the world. All right, great. Thanks, Mark. Don. Hello, everyone. Thank you uh, for this opportunity. It's always great to uh, join you guys. Uh, irrespective of the fact that we're spread around uh, the, uh, the country at, at this moment. Uh, as the intro was, Don Aviv, I am uh, a longtime member of ASIS, along with my uh, brethren on this, on this podcast, uh, and happy to be so. Uh, I run Interfor International, which is a 40-year-old corporate intelligence and security consulting firm. Uh, right now, I'm sitting in New York City in the heart of Manhattan, which is a uh, literal uh, um, a ghost town. Uh, and I'm one of the few people in Midtown that has the luxury of being, uh, or the burden of being uh, considered an essential service, uh, like most of our security professionals are around the country. And therefore, I am duty bound to be in the office uh, and at my desk. So uh, happy to be here. Yeah, and Don, as you mentioned, you're in New York City. And one of the great things about having you two guys on is you don't just represent different sides of the industry, but uh, different geographic perspectives. So Mark in Canada and you in New York and and Mark back to you. How are things going in Canada? How has the response been there locally? Yeah, thanks Eddie. Uh, response has been um, has been drastic. I think uh, from uh, I've been working from home now since March 13th. Uh, we're a software company as you know and, and, and flipping that switch for us was was quote-unquote relatively easy I guess. Uh, you know, our clients, our security service providers, of course, you know, working from home is not an option, right? I mean, Don, Don case in point, you know, providing intel and insight and, and, and knowledge uh, and um, right from, from his office. Um, Canada as a whole, uh, I'm, I'm based in Montreal, which is kind of on the eastern side. Uh, unfortunately, Quebec, uh, the province that I'm in, has the distinction of having the highest numbers in Canada right now and um, seems to be because of where our spring break was and a fair bit of travel in that time and uh, it was it was right right in the beginning of March and then other provinces was going to be much later so a lot of people were traveling during during that uh, during that time social distancing uh, here like everywhere else uh, explained in in terms of people will understand uh, saw the city of Toronto had posted an, a um, a poster about keeping at least a hockey stick apart from uh, the person next to you so I thought that was uh, that was quite funny but uh, stimulus packages um, for for businesses for for employees people that are out of out of, uh, out of work uh, and then generally security being labeled as an essential service uh, to, to what Don mentioned before so uh, security service providers continue to uh, to deliver service generally uh, states of emergency in, in most uh, most cities towns uh, provinces and uh, to different degrees of course in uh, uh, of late, uh, I was reading a, reading a report yesterday, uh, local police here have given out hundreds of fines uh, for people not respecting, uh, mm -hmm. not respecting the, uh, the ask to, uh, to, be, uh, to be socially distant. So yeah, that's a quick, a quick recap there. 
Yeah, and being from Alabama, you can explain to me later what a hockey stick is. <laughs> Show me a picture one of these days. But, um, and Don, you mentioned being in New York. Obviously, what we see on the media, that's a real hot spot and a lot of challenges there. So what have you seen locally? Well, first of all, we have the unfortunate designation of once again being called ground zero for uh, uh, a national or international uh, tragedy. Um, our death count is the highest in the nation and is on track to beat uh, Italy uh, in, as projected, which is unfortunate. We are seeing a very mixed response here. Um, first of all, we have a we have the, the country's largest police force of 38,000 police officers. Uh, last count, I'm looking at the stats now, we had uh, something like uh, 5,000 to 6,000 officers call in sick alone. Uh, many of them uh, are in, unfortunately impacted, whether at home via a spouse or a family member or themselves. So when you look at the statistics, um, you know, that number is rising every day. We have federal agents, we have the military uh, on the ground here. There are a number of field hospitals that have been set up in public parks and convention centers. Uh, it li literally is out of a, a Netflix original movie or some sort of uh, movie. It's, it's, I've never seen anything like this, even after 9-11, um, when we had a fully militarized city. Uh, right now, the avenues and the streets are empty. Um, but we're having, uh, we're seeing an increase and it's not really going reported uh, for a number of reasons, but crime is up, not just cyber crime, but physical crime yeah. is up because there's a lot of opportunity here at this point. Um, stores are boarded up and while some departments and organizations and stores and retail organizations are increasing security, many of them are decreasing just because it's harder to man a post or transit is becoming very difficult. So what we're seeing is stores are just boarding themselves up or just locking down. And what you're having is the opportunistic uh, uh, crime of the smash and grabs and the breaking and entering. And, and the, to add to that, uh, law enforcement is not making the arrests. They're, they're not engaging with a typical transient or, or uh, suspicious individual that they used to because of the nature of not wanting to get into that close proximity of having to put handcuffs on an individual or even engage with an individual. So we're seeing the mixed result of uh, increased opportunity for, for you know, criminal behavior at the same time a reluctance of law enforcement to engage um, with individuals that they normally would have uh, stopped and, and had a conversation with. So. I see this as a problem, um, and we're going to see, I think, an increase in uh, in, in crime uh, exponentially in the coming days. It's already ticking up, uh, but at the same time, reporting is going down. So, uh, who, who's to say what the end result is going to be? Um, as far as uh, uh, you know, what's happening in New York, it's truly debilitating. Uh, you're having essential services mandated to work, but we're having, you know, we, we don't have access to the PPE. We don't have access to transit. Uh, you know, I, I can't take the subway or trains right now myself. I've been driving um, just because that's the only thing available to me. Mm -hmm. And it's just, it's difficult. And uh, you're seeing the real resist, uh, resistance, resistancy of, uh, of just the social fabric holding together. But I'm curious to see what happens in the coming Over day. Time. Yeah. yeah, and you raise a great point. I think it is certainly a mixed bag right now. I was on a call just before we jumped on this podcast and I was being asked, and I get this question quite a bit, as I'm sure you guys do, um, where do you stand? Is business going up? Is it going down? How are you being impacted? It really is a mixed bag. We're seeing that, you know, throughout the landscape from coast to coast where we're having issues just like every other business is having. Officers being quarantined, some testing positive, issues around PPE. And the analogy that I've been making, which is not exact, exactly apples to apples here but it's like after a natural disaster we're experiencing the same thing that our customers and the rest of the world's experiencing except we are in that essential worker category so we're having to really um, make sure we can get through that somehow and continue to provide those services while at the same time dealing with the workforce it has to remain safe themselves the issues with ppe and making sure we can meet the customers demands and you put it very well don about the uh, criminal issues are certainly going to increase. And then you have that with law enforcement being diminished and, and other issues. But, but Mark, what, what are you seeing as far as, as your conversations with people in the industry? How are they trying to really get through some of these uh, toughest challenges? 
Yeah, great, great points, Eddie and uh, and and Don too, of course. But uh, I think it really, from what I've seen, so surveying uh, whether it's Security Service Council uh, members, whether it's other uh, security service providers, uh, we work with with over six hundred of them uh, globally, and it really depends on um, the sectors that they're in. You know, the type of work that they're uh, that they're doing, the type of work that they're delivering, uh, the geography that they're in too. Of course, in terms of timing, you know, kind of what part of the pandemic that they're in, and if it's still sort of early days or or uh, you know the kind of right uh, right in the middle of it, and then the ability to pivot is another thing that I've uh, I've I've kind of heard a lot about. Uh, you know, folks that were maybe uh, in the uh, or heavily into the event and uh, and uh, or major event space, um, hospitality sectors, those kind of things, able to pivot into more, much more you know kind of frontline essential retail, uh, getting into uh, you know kind of outside or external kind of temperature checks and so on. Um, it's uh, many of them dealing with, you know, what, what Don described, you know, the, the, the COVID crimes, the break and enters, the fraud schemes uh, that are out there and, and going on and really having to adjust to how they're offering service. Uh, Eddie, you touched on it, you know, getting a guard to a site uh, is tougher and tougher and tougher. You know, if you can't take public transit, if you can't easily get in and get out and, you know, what if, uh, uh, God forbid, somebody falls sick uh, and, then you know has to uh, has to self quarantine. At the same time, you know corporate security folks, you know they're switching gears, right? Their 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 assets remain the same, but how they are and 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 the condition of those assets is probably uh, changing. And and they go from a lot of sort of prevention and planning to now actually responding, you know, and kind of getting into those uh, incidents and issues. And I mean, I'm impressed. Business continuity professionals, emergency management folks, you know, r really rolling up their sleeves and and uh, executing those uh, those different plans and. Um, how the service providers are, are deploying their security teams to respond to the different, uh, different issues, I think is one that we're going to see not only change now during the pandemic, but I think over time and sort of as we get through it, uh, we're going to see that, uh, we're going to see those uh, service offerings probably, uh, probably change as well. Um, quick comment about industry associations, you know, as, as both you've mentioned, we're, we're part of ASIS International, but it's been refreshing to see the different associations come together and, and share resources, whether it's SMB resources, uh, you know, on kind of how those companies can get uh, get help, but all the way through to, you know, actual, you know, COVID-19 pages and different resources that people can, uh, can, can pull up. Um, as, as a software company, you know what, our, our mission is to, to, to build software, right? So we're looking at uh, current situations, current market, current uh, challenges, and we're saying, well, how can we help, you know, uh, security businesses run, uh, run smarter, run differently, and then really affect that kind of the value equation of security to kind of say, okay, we're being recognized now as an essential service and we're able to kind of deliver, but what about down the road, right? How can uh, security uh, really position itself um, more so now uh, to uh, to kind of go forward and uh, and be uh, either more efficient, provide better insight, or provide uh, added value. Yeah, and, and and you mentioned the association with ASIS International, which we're all involved in, and we're currently working on a project uh, to really recognize the security officer. And I think one of the silver linings, if there is one, that comes out of this is really recognizing how valuable those frontline security officers really are. Um, they're being asked to do things they could not have imagined they were, would be doing just a few months ago or even a few weeks ago. So I think moving forward, and we'll talk about that here in just a minute and get you guys thoughts on how this is going to change security services moving forward. But, but Don, one of the, the, the issues we've heard a lot about is people working from home. Uh, we've gone through that ourselves, uh, and it's not just as easy as saying, hey, grab a laptop, go home and keep working. You have all kinds of issues related to cybersecurity. And I've actually talked to some people just this week uh, about some issues that, that a lot of people don't even think about when it comes to trade secrets, intellectual property, et cetera. So what are you hearing and what are your thoughts on, on some of those vulnerabilities that are going to be popping up based on remote work? Well, I mean, cybercrime is up. It's up astronomically. I mean, we're, we're seeing stats anywhere from 75 to 90% as far as the vectors of attack against uh, uh, medium-sized businesses, small businesses, large businesses. We've seen it all, and it's, it's actually pretty scary. And we're talking about everything from, you know, the, the scams, the frauds that normally hit uh, um, companies are now being targeted at individuals at home. So you may have a world-class data protection uh, uh, system or organization within your company or, you know, great 
great IT security uh, protocols and, and procedures. But when you're working from home and you're working off your home laptop or, or uh, you know, your old PC, all that goes out the window. And there are a lot of uh, vulnerabilities that you may not have envisioned and neither did your company because for most of us, this happened very quickly. Uh, we didn't have the opportunity to start issuing technology and equipment and sending people home. A lot of companies just had to you know, rush their people home and rely on Zoom and a lot of these uh, networking uh, systems that we now know are extremely vulnerable. I mean, this, this uh, system we're using right now is, is considered highly vulnerable and the FBI has issued warnings not to use it. Well, you know, that's <laughs> we're doing it right now and so are many companies and that's how they're surviving. Um, so we're seeing fraud go through the roof, uh, attacks, and everything from, you know, the checks that are supposed to come from the government to uh, uh, help people out. There's a lot of scams hitting. And quite frankly, federal agents are working from home. A lot of the DOJ, FBI, uh, Secret Service, they're, they're working from home too. So we're having, what you're seeing is, a tremendous increase in attack vectors at the same time uh, 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 a de-escalation in the in the number of resources we had as a society to fight and protect against this so I will say there's one positive is I've never seen in all my years in the industry um, this this kind of and as Mark uh, uh, mentioned before this coming together of security professionals across organizations and in different trade groups and I've seen a tremendous uh, amount of cross-pollination and coordination and it really makes me feel good I mean I'm seeing y2k handbooks being brushed off uh, and, and brought into service which you know I thought I would never see those uh, those books again in my, in my lifetime but that's that's how far back we're going but at the same time you know the, the bad guys are coming up with new and, and greater attacks and, and, and they're being successful. I mean, right now, you know, the big banks are, are warning against uh, uh, attacks against individuals, hacks and, and fraud schemes that are successful and we don't have the resources to really protect against it. So it's beholden upon us as security professionals to let our, uh, our, our teams know and the, and the companies we work for to be cognizant and to be very hyper aware and vigilant as to what's going on. And, you know, it was what, in the, in the old days, not so long ago, maybe a week ago, two weeks ago, you can walk down to IT and say, hey, I got this email or something's happening that's weird on my device. Now we don't have that luxury. You know, we have to hope, hopefully reach someone who's working from home and may not be available because, you know, their kids are running around crazy in the house. So this is a, this is a new normal. It's a, I, I feel that we're going to be really learning a lot about how business runs, the security business and the clients that we all support uh, going forward. So this is, these are interesting times and I hope someone uh, is really taking note of all that's, that's, that's uh, transpiring. Yeah, and one of the things we've talked a lot about internally is, is just how different business continuity planning is going to be in the future. Uh, I know just our personal planning has already uh, taken on many different shapes and forms, just planning for the future. We've got to get out of this first. Uh, and I want to ask you guys the magic question I get asked, and I'm sure you do every day, when's this going to be over? Uh, we have to define over first, but I think business continuity planning is going to look a lot different in the future. We're all learning a lot. And when it comes to associations, you know, we mentioned ASIS International uh, being one of the main associations that we're all active in, but all associations have done a great job that I've seen in our space, and it really uh, highlights the value of being a part of those associations. I've talked to a lot of colleagues in the security industry uh, just in the past few days, and I'll share information, and they'll ask me to source. And I'll tell them one of the associations and they will talk about how they can access that because they're not part of that association. They're not plugged in. So that's been invaluable. Um, well, let me ask one of the biggest questions here and we'll, we'll sort of uh, uh, try to predict as much as we can to see what the future holds. But uh, if you could sort of just explain how do you think this is going to change security services moving forward, what would you say? Well, I mean, I'll take a stab at it. Uh, I think you're going to see an increase in in uh, remote security, and I know that that concept is very um, amorphous and it's very hard to pin down. But I would say w we're seeing some good come from this as far as protection yeah. of resources and IP and and facilities. But I think you're going to see um, a shift 
to more remote digital surveillance type security uh, than your typical officer at a post. Uh, because you know this is the opportunity, unfortunately, for many of these union jobs here in, in the tri-state area of New York and New Jersey and Connecticut to, to use this opportunity to say, hey, listen, you know, we can provide the same level of protection you know, by putting you know, a couple guys behind a, a bank of cameras as opposed to you know, boots on the ground. So I think that's going to be, there'll be a shift in the type of protection you'll see or services offered, uh, but we'll have to be, you know, we'll have to be uh, flexible and, and see what's what, what we can offer the, our clients. But unfortunately, many of our clients may not be coming back from this. And I think we're yeah. seeing that, especially on the retail side. Um, in the, uh, uh, the Northeast retail, a lot of retail organizations that we would have, you know, traditionally pr uh, protected and, and supported will not be coming back from this. So what the industry looks like will be dependent upon what our client base looks like. Um, and, but I'm, I'm hopeful. And I think to take a stab at it, I think New York will begin to come, New York City will become, begin to come back, I think, in two weeks time. I think that you'll start seeing a more an increase in the volume of or who's designated an essential service and i think you'll see a lot of those come you know back in um slowly but i caution one thing and you know we speak to medical professionals and we're in on the oem and a lot of the uh, uh, organizations that are dedicated to to managing this crisis here in the northeast and we're saying that this is going to happen in waves uh the biggest uh, um, concern will be um today you know we may have a, a dip in the number of uh, infections and the death rate but since everything takes kind of a two week 14 to 20 yeah. day uh, um cycle um if we let off too quickly and everyone goes back to work too quickly um then we can have a new peak in, in infections and that's what's happening in europe and in, even in asia right now some of our offices in asia are coming back online and some of our clients are but at the same time we're seeing new infections in Hong Kong, Singapore, Taiwan, et cetera. And so that's a concern. And here in this you know, densely populated area of New York City, um, the concern is if everyone goes back to work too soon, uh, we'll, we'll have an issue again uh, in the middle of summer and possibly the end of the summer. Because the, uh, the, the previous belief of temperature not being, a, uh, or being an, an indicator of, you know, if, when it's too hot, the, the, the uh, infection rate goes down is, is not proving uh, uh, realistic because we're seeing a spike in Latin America and in, and in uh, Africa as well. So, um, I don't know when that date will be for the rest of the country, but you know it's kind of a wave that's starting on the East Coast and going going uh, west. So hopefully, uh, you know this will peter out by the end of the summer for for all of us. Um, but it's dependent upon testing and dependent upon um, what we can have as far as uh, you know some sort of antibody defense uh, protocol yeah. by uh, the health professionals. Yeah. Well, let's hope it's sooner rather than later. So, uh, Mark, how is this going to change our industry moving forward? Good, uh, good, good, great question and good insight, uh, Don. It, one thing for sure, uh, cold is not an indicator in terms of when this can be, uh, when this can be curbed because uh, weather's been up and down here of late and uh, we still see our numbers going up. So uh, hopefully, uh, an unfortunate, it's unfortunate that heat isn't. Um, you know what, uh, Eddie, I think to answer the question, it, there, were, there were issues in the industry before, right? Especially if we think about the frontline security industry and, and sort of the boots on the ground that Don referred to, uh, lots of turnover. It was really tough to hire, uh, retain engaged security officers. Uh, I think forward looking um, end users or security managers uh, were looking at service offering from a company and you know what what does that look like and then again forward-looking security service providers were saying like you know what we're not just going to provide manpower we'll provide you know manpower with some technology with some shared services and and so on so really get a mix uh, across that and um, the other thing that that uh, or the other service delivery method I think that's going to continue going up is, is all the, the shared service or the mobile service as uh, something that was on an uptick in the last uh, in the last uh, year or so uh, but anything to do with alarm response and patrol work I think as uh, as, as boroughs neighborhoods uh, municipalities and so on put in you know false alarm fines and so on that was kind of slowly sort of increasing that I think that something like this where uh, it's tougher to get human resources to move around 
uh, is going to uh, definitely uh, definitely increase. And then uh, to Don's point, you know, using less less number of officers, and then uh, choosing choosing how they get deployed and, and what sort of work that they do. So uh, whether it's sitting behind a bank of uh, of monitors, but just kind of better human resource or more efficient human resource uh, deployment, uh, the the human or the security officer for for the judgment, and then the machine uh, for that kind of regular surveillance and and the day to day. Um, I mean, I've, I've read a lot and, and seen some comments in and around uh, pushing minimum pay rates up. You know, is that going to stick around? Is that just going to be a short term thing? I'd love to hear, you know, you guys' take on that. And then essential services, you know, what's what's the longevity? What's the longevity behind that? Uh, right now, there's definitely a sentiment of, you know, frontline security. Uh, let's appreciate them. Let's thank them. Let's, you know, um, uh, be, be uh, recognizant of them sort of, go, you know, going to work day to day and, uh, and, and supporting that uh, things uh, continue. Uh, I, hopefully that'll stick around afterwards. Um, and that's, I think, on us to kind of make sure that that recognition uh, continues to happen from the public and then also from the greater security community, uh, too. Uh, in terms of timeline, uh, I think I think we're, we're months uh, or month, maybe minimum, kind of for local sort of easing up. Uh, you know, I've heard uh, a lot of major events uh, up here have been canceled. Um, I've heard comments in around, you know, schools gradually going back, maybe half classes in the morning, half classes in the afternoon to kind of have a little bit more space between students. Uh, some questions or some some discussions in and around, um, you know, the, the less traditional rush hour that we're, you know, kind of accustomed to P people being in the office from nine to five, or maybe extending those hours, you know, for when people do start coming back to allow for uh, kind of a mixed uh, uh, or, or to spread out the number of people on on things like transit and uh, and so on. So um, t time will tell, but uh, uh, definitely having access to uh, to different people's opinions and insight and considering the source of in the sources of information, I think it's uh, going to help us uh, predict when that's uh, when that's going to happen. Well, just to throw in, if you don't mind, uh, there's been talking about market pressures. There's been some interesting market movement here in uh, in the Northeast. Uh, you know, as far as the ability to retain and obtain armed security. So we're seeing some very interesting things. First of all, you know, armed security has always been a problematic or difficult uh, um, concept to, to uh, obtain here in, in the Northeast for a variety of reasons. But we're seeing that, um, you know, it's, it's drying up uh, almost overnight the ability to, to have an armed security officer at a site for a number of reasons. One, you know, uh, NYPD and the police departments were usually the backstop for that, where you could have an off-duty officer or a special duty officer or whatever you de what, what, what was designated. And now because of the numbers of officers out sick on their daytime patrol for their municipalities um, and the numbers of, uh, you know, uh, illnesses, they're mandating 12-hour, 14-hour shifts by the municipalities. And therefore, no one has the time or the energy or the ability to work a second job, if you will. And so those numbers are just going down and you're seeing an increase in the rate of uh, off um, unarmed security officers skyrocket uh, in, in this area. And so we're seeing crisis pay that is four times minimum wage, sometimes five times, sometimes six times minimum wage at certain uh, locations, which is a boon for those officers that could take those jobs. But at the same time, the security guard companies have to be re um, responsive to moving these pay rates and billing and everything else. So we're just seeing it's all gummed up in the system right now. But I think yeah. that after this is all over, there's going to be a, a real look at how we deal with crises, how we deal with these types of scenarios. Because my belief is it's the new normal. We're going to have these types of incidents on a on a more frequent basis, unfortunately. So the the unarmed security officer, uh, that that job demographic, there'll be more responsibilities. There'll be uh, um, you know better training and 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 more needs and more more asks for them going forward. And I think that pay will slowly creep up, which is a benefit. But at the same time, um, you know what that does to the total industry will be uh, yet to be determined. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's certainly a, a big factor moving forward is uh, so goes the economy, so goes our industry in certain respects, and, and things are, are certainly the new normal right now, and, and a lot of talk about how, how long that will last, the, the pay rates, uh, the, the increased need, and, and, and as you both have pointed out very well, human resources are finite, uh, that there's only enough uh, 
uh, bodies to go around, so to speak. And, and we do quite a bit of work with off-duty law enforcement, and those resources are very limited right now. So even if you have that as part of your contingency plan, it's not working out too well uh, when you make yeah. those phone calls because they're stretched thin, and and, and it's really hard to, to go to plan B when your plan B is somebody else's plan A. So uh, <laughs> very tough to deal with that. So um, guys, I can't thank you enough. Excellent thoughts, excellent comments. Uh, I picked the, the right two guys to talk with me today about the coronavirus situation and uh, doing so under different circumstances here on this platform that uh, we won't name, as Don pointed out. Uh, uh, we'll try to use uh, something different in the future. But guys, again, thanks so much for sharing your insight uh, on what's going on in the industry and, and in your respective locations. Can't thank you enough. And Look forward to seeing you in person, hopefully very soon. Same. Be safe. Thanks, guys. Be Take safe. care.